Well, it's good to see you guys today. Alex, you were the only one first and second service to say good to see you. I appreciate that. I tell you, I appreciate that so very much. How many of you guys are here this morning? Okay, well, I'm grateful to know that there's some folks here today. And everybody's smiling at this point, you know, right? Amen. But uh, it's good to see you guys this morning. If you have your Bibles, I hope you'll turn with us to 1 Timothy chapter 1. We'll be spending our time there this morning. We will also be in the book of Joshua chapter 1 for just a little bit. So if you want to find that passage as well, you're welcome to do that. And we'd love for you to take that opportunity today. We, We continue our study on leadership that we began last week. And today we're going to address the matter of truth and how that truth itself is so critical to the life of the leader. That's going to be our focus this morning. Paul's writing to Timothy. We talked about this last week. He's writing to Timothy who has been sent back to Ephesus. Paul had been through Ephesus, had birthed a church that was there, spent a short time in Ephesus, and had now left, and the church had sort of begun to sort of go off the rails a bit. Paul actually sent Timothy back to the church in order to help the church to know how that they might be able to lead, how they might be able to ultimately live out their lives in an appropriate manner. If you have your Bibles on 1 Timothy 1, I'd love for you to turn over a couple of pages to 1 Timothy 3. I, I want to just take an opportunity to sort of point out the, what many have defined as the hinge or the key verse or verses of the book of 1 Timothy. And I'd like for us to at least look at that, if we could, please, very quickly. Because 1 Timothy 3, verses 14 and 15 says, to, he writes to Timothy, although I hope to come see you soon. Again, Paul's desire was to get back to Ephesus, to spend some time there, to help them mature and develop them. The problem is that he's not sure that, although I hope to get there soon, I'm writing these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how the people ought to conduct themselves in God's household. The God's household spoken of here is not talking about the brick and mortar that, we, that we're in. It's not the physical church building. The household is, speaks about the people that are a part of the church. We are the family of God. And what he's saying is I'm writing to you to help to understand how that the people of God ought to live out their faith, to be able to uh, demonstrate their faith, which is the church of the living God. And then he says this, And ultimately, when we understand that, we really need to understand that the church itself becomes the pillar and foundation of the truth. You and I have been given the responsibility to be able to carry that to the lost and dying world. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And while the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy as he was trying to help him to understand the significance of the responsibility and the role, he wanted them to be able to embrace the fact that God has called them to a very high calling and that's to hang on to and to be proponents of and teachers of and models of the truth of God's revelation to the world. You know, the reality was, as we talked about last week, he's writing to a church that had begun to go off the rails a bit. And we know that they were going off the rails a bit. If you'll jump in with me at verse 3, chapter 1, verse 3, we'll see that, in, that understanding. He said, he said to verse 3, he says, When I left for Macedonia, I urged you to send Ephesus to stop those whose teaching is contrary to the truth. If you were to jump down to verse 7, we talked about this very quickly last week. They were desiring, these teachers of the not so much truth, were desiring to be teachers of the law without understanding. The word without understanding there simply means to comprehend something on the basis of careful thought. In other words, they had not given much thought to what they were saying. They had heard something that was popular, they had heard something that sounded good, and they were simply repeating those kind of things to the church around them. They were finding ways to be able to take that which was maybe less than true, something a little bit less than what it ought to be, and be able to be proponents of that. And while they found themselves to be teachers of the law, they really had no understanding of what it was, either, either what they're saying or the things that, about which they're, that they make confident assertions. So what can we say about these individuals? Let me give you a little synopsis, if I can, over the book of 1 Timothy. If you were to sort of go and take a synopsis of these people, let me just mention to you, if I can, a few things that we we can identify, that Paul identifies regarding them. Chapter 1, verse 3, they were straying in their doctrine. 
Chapter 1, verse 4, they were preoccupied by myths, genealogies, and speculations. Chapter 1, verse 7, they were misusing the law of God. Chapter 1, verses 19 and 20 gives to us an insight that they themselves were living immoral lives. Chapter 4, verse 2, their conscience were seared. Chapter 4, verse 3, they were forbidding marriage and and, uh, and denying certain foods. They were upholding certain parts of the law, but letting other parts go astray. Chapter 6, verse 4, they craved controversy and quarrels because it brought attention to themselves. And they were ultimately, chapter 6, verse 5, using godliness for material gain. When we look at what Paul had to say to Timothy regarding those who were in the church speaking something contrary to that which was truth, Paul writes to them and says, it's your responsibility to be able to help set things right, to uphold and protect that which God has entrusted to the church, we being pillars and foundations of the truth. That brings me to a, 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 a question that I think would be helpful for us to understand, or at least some thoughts to understand regarding this matter of truth. So with your notes open this morning, I'd love to just identify two or three things before we actually get into the text, and then we'll get into the text of what the text has to say to us this morning. First thing I want to um, acknowledge this morning, that truth is not universally understood. In other words, we live in a world today that, uh, that we're moving more and more, and we're really there. We're in a post-Christian world. We do know that. But in a post-Christian world, basically, we basically have, have, have basically stated that there are no absolute truths. There's no, nothing that we can hold on to that's absolute. You know, that, 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 that makes sense in this world that we live in because four plus four, uh, two plus two sometimes equals four, sometimes equals five, sometimes equals six, right? No, two plus two always equals four. So there's at least a little bit of absolute truth around us. If I were to go up on top of this building, as I understand someone did back in the day, and actually jumped off the end of the building up here, I'm, I imagine that with this old body with old bones, I would break something severely. Simply because gravity is an absolute truth whether we think it is or not. There's a lot of things in our culture today just that are naturally understood that are absolutes without regard to our personal preference or experience or desires. The reality is Paul was talking about something that's beyond that which is natural. He's talking about specifically the revelation of God and God's revealed word to us as, as the truth to be upheld. But what we do need to understand that even in the matters of natural truth, which is observable, not everyone agrees. Second thing I'd like to say this morning, not every well-intended Christian leader models nor teaches truth. We find ourselves in a culture today living in amongst a, a world of televangelists, of, who of many, of which, many of whom draws a huge crowd, Many times they do that both in, 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 their, in their gatherings of their church, church meetings and possibly online as well. And, and what we do find is sometimes it's the, the reason why they're as popular as they are is because they have some nugget of truth that nobody else has discovered. The reality is when we look at those and you begin to look at those lives of people, sometimes you find those people, and we've seen it in our, in our lifetime, those people who actually draw big crowds does not necessarily always live a good moral life. Would you agree? Sometimes we've shot ourselves in the foot terribly bad, right? Because of the way we've chosen to live our lives. Paul's speaking to a church that's actually having those people who stand in positions of leadership, probably I'm going to assume well-intended people, but obviously what they were teaching was something contrary to the truth. It's not new to our culture or even to Apostle, the Apostle Paul's culture. If you just go back to the time of Jesus, Jesus had a group of people who were well-intended people, the Apostle Paul being a part of that well-intended group in that day, a group of people called the Pharisees. Remember those guys? They and Jesus didn't, didn't, didn't always agree, right? 
There were times that they, that they had opposition, they had argument, well, not arguments, but they had, they had things that they disagreed among, and, and ultimately they found themselves oftentimes at odds with each other. Jesus had something to say regarding them in, Act, in Matthew chapter 23, and that's the passage he called them whitewashed walls. I don't think that was a word of encouragement. Anyway, Matthew 23, verses 1 and following, this is what it says. Write that verse down somewhere. You don't have to go there with me now, but write it down. Go back and read Matthew 23 as it relates to those Christian leaders modeling or teaching truth. Listen to what it says. Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, he's talking not to the Pharisees, he's talking to the people who are, who are there following after him, to his disciples that were close to him. And he says, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees are the official interpreters of the law of Moses. If you want to know what Moses had to say, just go see these guys. Verse 3 says, so practice and obey what they tell you. Because for the most part, what they tell you is truth. But the contrast here in verse 3 goes this way. But do not follow their example, for they do not practice what they teach. In reality, what Jesus said of the Pharisees in that day is what we would say about Congress of our day to day. They make laws for us to follow, but they themselves have no desire to follow after those same laws, correct? It is very possible for us to be able to live in a culture, and we've seen it lived out around us, to, to have very well-intended people who stands in positions of leadership who do not follow, do not do what they actually tell other people to do. Would you agree? Paul said, as to the church at church, I believe he said, we need to understand that that was what happens even in the life of this church. And we're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But I think we with this morning need to understand some definition of truth, at least as it relates to not just a secular worldview of, of, of truth, but also as it relates specifically to what we might understand from the New Testament and the Old Testament regarding truth. So with your notes still open, there's no fill in the blank un under this. Uh, what is truth defined? Giving a simple, simple uh, secular de uh, uh, d dictionary definition of truth. truth. Truth is that which conforms with fact or reality. It's genuineness, veracity, and actu or actuality. In a word, truth is simply reality. It is how, how, it is how things actually are, not how someone seeks to make them to be. I oftentimes, little, little Roxy's daughter, Audrey came, uh, she, she comes in the office quite regularly on, on the mornings and she loves pink. She wore pink this morning. She is a princess in many ways. Sweet girl, but I oftentimes say, Audrey, I love those pink shoes, those blue shoes you have on. And she'll look at me and she says, these are pink. And I keep saying, you know, Roger, I'm still trying to work on my colors. Thank you for helping me out. No matter how many times I might say that those shoes are blue, those shoes are still pink because the reality exists. That is a truth of what's taking place. And that's what the dictionary would say. The New Testament, however, would give a little bit different twist upon that, and I'd like this morning to be able to at least give some insight as to what the New Testament word regarding truth is. It's the word aletheia that actually gives to us an understanding about truth, and it says simply this, it is that which is divine, that which has been divinely revealed to us, and, is, and it is related that, to that which is, cannot be hidden, and it is open for everyone to see. In other words, God's revelation to us, as we would understand it, as he communicates truth in the New Testament, is that which is obvious to all, but yet it's been revealed to us by God. It's divine in nature, and yet it's not been hidden. It cannot be hidden. It's, it's, it's plain as the nose on your face. So many times in life, we want to take truth, and we want to take truth and turn it or twist it, or we want to take truth truth and do something different with it and the reality is all we simply need to do is look at it pink is still pink the old testament gives to us a little bit better understanding and i want to make sure we don't miss this truth is also firmness 
The Old Testament word for truth gives to us this understanding. It's constancy, an everlasting substance, something that can be relied upon since it is something that cannot change. Not only does the New Testament say truth is plain or it's obvious it can't, that it's that's not to be hidden, it's also Old Testament, it cannot change. So what was true yesterday is true today and will be true forever. Jesus, Hebrews 13, was the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is the truth of who Jesus is that brings about a sense of confidence in our walk, in our journey of faith, and we need that so that we can walk in this journey of life with a sense of clear direction. Here's the problem with our culture today. Since truth has become relative, nobody knows where they're going. I could spend a lot of time on how that is relating to where we are today and at least our younger culture as it relates to their understanding of their own identity and what we have this term now called what was your gender defined at birth. It's simply, as humbly as I know how to say it, it's simply we have lost sight of truth. And the absolute nature of truth that ought to be so simple and ought to be so comprehensible to everyone, that doesn't mean that we don't struggle with it. I'm going to talk about that in the, as we wrap up. But whether we struggle with it or not doesn't make it less true. And so this morning, I'd like for us with that said for us to dig into the word this morning a little bit and try to put some application into the truth that what Paul is trying to challenge Timothy to actually do with those who are teaching truth in the church. Truth, teaching the lack of truth in the church. And he does so starting in verse 3. He said this, As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine nor devote themselves to the myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than stewardship from God, that is, by faith. The aim of our charge, we talked about this specifically last week, is love. And that love is going to grow out of, or it, it is a blossom, it is the fruit that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. Paul gives to us in this concept, this idea, he gives to us a clear understanding of how it is that Timothy is to address those who are speaking things that are not true in the church. And he does so by helping Timothy to understand, first of all, the leader's residence, or what we may want to say, the leader's mission field. That's your first fill in the blank underneath that. He reminds him that God has called you to Ephesus. Doesn't matter whether you'd rather be in Galatia or Colossae or whatever other town it may be. The bottom line is God has called you to Ephesus. And that has to be your place of ministry because that's where God has placed you as it relates to us today. Wherever we find ourselves today, in a culture, wherever we are, where it's in a workplace or wherever it's in a parenting or whether it's in a family or whatever, no matter what we find ourselves in, we need to understand this concept. God's put you there. We may not like it. We may not really want to be there. But I want you to grasp an understanding that if we will simply bloom where you're planted, we'll see God do some amazing things that only God can do. You know, that's the concept of what it was. Remember Jeremiah 29? We've just been out of the book of Jeremiah not, long, not, not too long ago, or at least chapter 29. And Jer Jeremiah's word to the Israelites who've been taken into captivity in Babylon, who obviously is saying, I don't want to stay here. I want to go home. 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 And Jeremiah says, I understand that you may want to go home, but you're there right now. So while you're there, do what God's called you to do there. And if you'll do that, God will bless you, and he's going to bless the people around you as well. Because I believe every one of us have a place in life where we've been called to serve, where we've been called to lead out. We talked last week about every one of us are leaders. None of us are exempt from that. 
We all have people around us that we ultimately influence. We have, we have places around us that we, are, that we, uh, that we exert our, our influence and our direction toward. And it may not be, we may not have positions of, of influence or positions of leadership, but we have places of leadership. We have places and people of influence that we must be cognizant of. And hence, we need to understand that God has given to you and I a mission field. Rather than trying to look for something different, why don't we just blossom where we've been planted? I asked you a while ago to turn with me to Joshua chapter 1. I didn't turn yet, so I'm going to give you a moment or two to get there while I'm getting there also. Joshua chapter 1. I believe there's a parallel. We could oftentimes say, I believe we could say regarding Joshua, Joshua could be the Old Testament Timothy. You know, God, Joshua's on the scene, and uh, now in chapter 1, the Bible says to us clearly, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses, my assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, it's your time to arise and go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I'm giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, just as I promised Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon as far as the great river, river Euphrates. And he goes on and talks about the specific, the, 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 the specific nature of the places that they will go and the land that God's already given to them. And God simply says, Joshua, it's your turn to lead. It's your time. Paul had been helped to birth the church at Ephesus and he writes back to Timothy and he says, Timothy, it's your time to lead. And we've been given a place, a mission field, every one of us. God simply invites us to simply serve and lead where we're planted. And I think the invitation while it is an invitation, it's also a responsibility that we've been given as well, and we need to take that responsibility well. The second point I'd like to say is that there's also in this passage in chapter, three, chapter 1, verse 3, hold your f- finger in Joshua. We will be back there, I promise. Joshua, in, in t- t- 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, he says not only to remain at Ephesus, but I'm calling you to charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. Now, here's what, when I read this, when I began studying for this passage and really ultimately a few months back actually sort of going through giving some kind of outline or order to what we're going to be doing over the next few weeks, when I first read this, I thought, well, okay, he, Timothy, I sort of got the idea, as I think most of us would, Timothy has been given the charge to go point his finger at these folks and say, you ought not to be doing that. But as I began to study this passage for today, I began to understand something very, very different. Matter of fact, I'd like to draw your attention this morning to the word charge. Some of your translations may have it a slightly different. But the, but the application here is, I urged you when I was going to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons. The word charge there is an interesting word. It comes from two words that's been put together in the Greek language. It comes from the word angelos, which sounds a lot like angel. Thank you. I knew y'all knew that. You're just, you're just trying to be respectful. I understand. Appreciate that. Angelos and also the word para. And we've taken the two words and placed them together. The word para literally means to come alongside of. And what he says to Timothy, he simply says, that I've, I've, I'm, here's, here's my challenge to you, Timothy, that you need to be a messenger alongside of these, these uh, erroneous teaching disciples. Don't stand off at a distance saying, shame on you. I want you to come alongside them and help them to know a different way. That's what God's called us to do. That's the whole mentoring process. And I believe in our culture today, we've not, we've not seen uh, the, the damage that the, that the enemy is going to do in our, in our world today because, because we've, we, we're not quite there yet. But I'm convinced today if we don't take seriously this matter of helping people to come along in this journey of faith, we're going to see the enemy do great damage to the church before this, this whole thing's over. So I think the call to us is simply that. 
that we, like Timothy, would receive the call from the Word of God to understand that it's our responsibility to, to be the messengers alongside of those people around, our, around us and our influence. That we might ultimately not just tell them what needs to be done, but that we might show them how it's to be done. Here's how it works out in life. So often in church, we have stood in our Sunday school classes and our, in our pulpits, and we've told people, when crisis comes in your life, we quote passages like Matthew chapter 6, don't be anxious, don't, don't worry about anything. If God's taking care of the flowers and the birds, he'll take care of you. Or maybe Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known unto God. What do we need to do? Above all else, when you get into crisis of life, just don't worry about it. Have y'all ever been in a crisis? One thing I can tell you for sure is the natural tendency for humanity is, to, is not to not worry. That probably didn't make sense. The natural tendency is for us to be anxious, to be troubled. And here's what happens. If we're, if we're, if we're not careful in the church, we will, we will preach that gospel so much that little, little, little Tommy or, or little Sammy or little, little Jane or whoever it possibly may be gets to a place and they're in a crisis and they find themselves all of a sudden worried about and anxious about their situation. And all they can remember are the words of the pastor that continue to drive down, don't be anxious. And we walk away from the situation, not only worried about our situation, but we're also feeling guilty about what I'm doing. However, if we as a body of Christ would come alongside of someone and Mr. and Mrs. Smith walks around with little Tommy and helps him to walk through life and Mr. and Ms. Smith comes through a crisis and Tommy looks at them and said, I've heard you say we ought not to worry and Mr. and Mrs. Smith finds himself wringing their hands in anxiety and then all of a sudden realizing that they do have a resource from God that they can lean upon and so they choose rather now not to do that but what they have an opportunity to do is to show Tommy that the worst thing in the world is not to fail in anxiety. The worst thing in the world is not to be repentant from where you've been. Not to, not, it's not about perfection. God's not seeking to, to demand perfection from all of us, but he is seeking to demand growth from all of us. And what we worried about yesterday, we don't need to worry about tomorrow because the trouble for tomorrow may be larger than yesterday. But if we've learned to work through the trials of yesterday with anxiety and seeing God come through along with somebody else, particularly tomorrow when the difficulty comes, all of a sudden we have a resource on the inside, not only from someone we knew and walked with us previously, but we've seen God do some amazing things in our life. And we can now today trust as we've not trusted before and it's because we've had someone to walk alongside with us we've had a messenger that walked with us a para and galas and we've seen that messenger help us through our own journey paul said that's what your responsibility is timothy to be a someone who comes alongside and helps the individual that you're seeking to lead. There's also a third thing that we find here, and that's the leader's reason or the passion, I think, of this process. What's the motivation? I'm going to ask you, if you would, if you would, to sort of hang on to first uh, John, uh, Joshua chapter 1. We'll be there in just a moment. But here, here's the bottom line. You and I will never take anyone anywhere that we've not been ourselves. You know, I, I talked to a gentleman at the end of the first service. He said, uh, Pastor, we're leaving for Illinois in the morning. And I said, well, bless your heart. He said, I'll be back in three weeks. Looking forward to that. Absolutely. Glad to know that. But I, he, did, he said that on the, per, on the back end of what I said here, first service. If somebody were to say, how do I get to North Carolina? I don't need a map. I don't need GPS. 
I can tell you the, 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 in, the, the exit ramps. I can tell you every step of the go, providing that there's not some major accident or some construction. I can tell you how to get there because I've been there many, many, many times. But if someone were to ask me, how do you get to Vermont? I would say, travel north, my friend. I don't know whether 95 goes through Vermont or not. I don't know. I've never been there. You see, it would be foolish for me to try to lead someone where I have never been. And so the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, he says, I need you to help people to travel the road that you're traveling. Here's how it works out. Verse 5, remember that we talked about last week? That's why I've given you these, these verses in this passage. The chapter, chapter 1, verse 5 of Timothy says this. You know, we get to the place that our aim of this charge, of this walking alongside, is that of love. And love, not speaking of love uh, that, that we're going to impose upon somebody else, but love that's going to flow from those who, we, who, who are leading, that love is driven from, it's coming out from, it becomes a natural byproduct of this thing we talked about last week, and I'm going to revisit just very briefly, first of all, of this pure heart. And that pure heart has to do with our growth, of personal growth. We, it's obvious, it's, it's, it's neat. I had an, had an opportunity this past week to speak with someone in our church family whose, uh, whose relative was recently saved. And the relative has been a sort of a, a character, uh, just to say the least. But the neat thing about hap that happened as, as I was speaking to this individual, they said this, but I've seen a real change in their heart. Because when Christ comes into our life, there's going to be life transformation, right? It's going to be seeable and noticeable. And the Apostle Paul challenges Timothy, I want you to continue the process of growing so that your heart will continually be made pure, that your heart will continue to grow and will find within it the opportunity for other people to be able to see and observe that. Verse 5 continues. But not only a pure heart, but also a good conscience. That has to do with the character development of the things of our life that we now are beginning to see and understand as, as God begins to develop our own character. And we now have love, genuine love, and we have peace, genuine peace, and we have, we have self-control, genuine self-control that's all being a byproduct of our personal growth and the character that God's seeking to develop within our lives. And he's going to use that to help shape those people that we are leading and lastly, a sincere faith. Ultimately, we talked about that faith that becomes public simply leading out loud. Paul to Timothy. Timothy, there's a challenge before you. And you've got to be able to lead these people. Walk with them. Help them to see what faith looks like as they see and observe your faith lived out before them. I ask you not to take your finger out of Joshua chapter one. I'd love for us to go back there because I just, as we sort of begin to wrap up our time together this morning, Joshua, you know, the story God tells Joshua, invites Joshua, God calls Joshua to a task to lead God's people into the promised land. Verses seven, eight, and nine, the instruction simply was in that second point of ours in the notes was simply that, you know, you have a responsibility, and that responsibility is to simply live out God's word. Be a student of God's word. Live it out, and you'll have success wherever you go. And ultimately, what we find in this journey of life is that there's also this passion, the mission, this mission, as it were, this mission reason. And we see that sort of as chapter 1 wraps up. Verse 10 says, and Joshua commanded the officers of the people to pass through in the midst of the camp. And what he's doing is God's talked to Joshua, and now Joshua's going to talk to the people, and he invites everybody to come gather around. Hey, guys, let's, let's have a powwow. Let's, let's build a bonfire, and we're going to sing Kumbaya and roast some marshmallows. We're going to have a good time together. But no, he's really inviting them together so we can have a conversation. In that conversation, he says, this is what God's told me. And I, I've got a hunch, just a hunch that Joshua told the people of Israel, this is the task God's called us to. 
to walk into the promised land. And guys, I I just want to, can I confess to you that I'm scared to death? I've got a hunch that Joshua was a little transparent with the people. There's reasons why I would say that. And I think God knew specifically what the anxiety of Joshua was because he told him three different times, be strong and of good courage. (laughs) Trust me, (laughs) you're going to want to quit. Just trust me. And I got a hunch he probably was honest enough with the people and he says, guys, God's called us to this task. I'm ready to lead out. Let's go. Verses 16 17 and 18 of that passage, listen to what it says. They answered Joshua, we will, we will do whatever you command us, and we will go wherever you send us. <laughs> we will obey you just like we obeyed Moses. <laughs> I got a hunch Joshua could have said, let's try not to do that. <laughs> let's work hard. <laughs> but at the end of the day, the people said, Joshua, it's because of your willing to lead us that we're willing to follow. You may be scared. We're probably scared too. But because you've chosen to lean lean in to the fact that God's promised you to be strong or challenged you to be strong and of good courage, we too are going to lean in and be challenged to be strong and of good courage because that's how that passage ends up. Verse 18. So what do I do with this passage? What do I do with it? I think there's a lot of things I could say this morning, and but let me let me let me wrap up with at least a couple of statements. But before I do that, let me remind you of two things I've said. One, I've already said you'll never take anybody anywhere that you're not at. And number two, what you say is a lot less impactful to someone's life than what you do. With those two things stated, let me give you a couple of points to wrap up, please. It is truth that's impacting or transforming our lives that gives you and I credibility to the message we have. I remember back many times in seminary that our professors used to tell us that unless the the truth of whatever passage is that we're preaching or teaching, if we've not filtered it through our lives, our message is going to be weak. It will not have an impact. Unless it's transformed our lives, we cannot expect it to be transformative to anybody else's life. And what we do know is this, that when we rebel, (laughs) do we have any rebels in here? Lying is still a sin, everybody else. I'm rebellious. Here's what I know. If you come to me and say, David, you need to do this, there's going to be a natural pushback from me. But here's what I also know. If you come alongside me and say, David, let's do this together, I'm going to lean in because I'm going to be willing to follow someone who invests their life into me. Does that make sense? If truth has not impacted our lives, it cannot impact others. But when we rebel against the truth, our impact is lessened, obviously, and the potential we become the cause for leading people astray, just like the church leaders in Ephesus. I'm going to meddle just a little bit. Can I do that this morning? Whether you're going to allow me to or not, I'm going to do it anyway. I do it out of love, and I hope you hear my heart of love this morning. But I hear this way, way too often in our culture today. We'll be in an environment somewhere where parents have their kids with them, sitting around in a party or sitting around in a restaurant, and they order for their kids a water or a Pepsi or whatever it is to drink, and they order for themselves adult drinks. And we tell our kids, you ought not to. And yet the only thing we're doing is telling our kids, you just can't wait till you get to. You're building a hunger inside of them for one day that they can be just like mom and dad to drink those adult drinks. I remember back so vividly back in the day, 
probably in the late 60s, the Marlboro commercial was on. I've said this to you. It's one of those commercials I will never forget. Dad and his son is out hunting or whatever it is, and the dad takes his puff off his cigarette, drops it down on the ground, walks off, and the son picks the cigarette up and puts it to his lips because at the end of the day, the son wants to be just like his dad. And parents today, I don't care what you tell your kids they ought to do. They're going to do what they see you do. So when we wait to go watch that movie that's not fit for children because they ought not to see it and we go sit when they're going to bed or whatever else, what does it say to our kids? It sends a mixed message. And I want to tell you our kids are listening and they're watching. And as parents, we have a responsibility to lead our children to faith in Jesus Christ. Second thing I'd like to say this morning in wrapping up is this. Will you spend the rest of your life? How will you spend it? I hope that you'll spend it as I've committed myself to spend it, to be a learner. A disciple never arrives. He only continues to learn. My dad used to say, and I've said this many, many times, he, he was 58 when I was born, and so everywhere I went, they always said, Mark, it was my, Marcus, that was my dad's name. Mark, this is your grandson, right? <laughs> no, it's my son. He was an older man when I was born. But he always used to say to people, and I'll never forget it, I hope it's the mantra of my life, if you ever get too old to learn, you're too old. We need to be a learner all of our lives, to be a disciple all of our lives, take, our, take the every opportunity we can to get back into the book and to study so that we my, our, ourselves are growing and developing, our hearts are becoming pure, our ca- character's developing, and ultimately our faith is becoming more evident to, evident to everybody. But whether we're a learner or not, I hope you we will be one. I hope at the end of the day, you'll determine that you will never cease modeling truth for the people you influence. Because people will more likely do what they see you do than they will to do what they hear you say to do. Would you pray with me, please? Father, we love you today. And we thank you so much for the abiding love, Father, that you have for us as your children. I'm so grateful, God, that you modeled for us through Jesus how to love, how to give, how to sacrifice, how to trust, how to walk together, how to disagree. God, we can learn through your son so many things if we would just simply Watch what he did. I pray, oh God, that for every adult here today, that you would call us out of mediocrity and call us to a platform where we too will never be to the level Jesus was. But we need to be to a place where we're willing to invite people to walk this journey of faith with us so that we might be able to make a few mistakes together, that's, that's okay. But in the process, we also are learning with someone else that walks with us. God, would you call us to a body of believers to rise up to the occasion that we would no longer find a place of isolation, but we would understand the responsibility that we all have in this place to become models and teachers of the pillar and foundation of the truth that God has called us as the church to be. Draw us to yourself, we pray today in Jesus' name. Amen.